Hello and welcome to an Up the Archer special to celebrate International Women's Day. Today is a day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women all over the world. This afternoon we'll be recognising and exploring our very own Archer sportswomen with a jam-packed show of guests, chats, features and news stories. But first, bringing us up to date with all things Kinkoi Campus, here's our very own Caitlin Meredith to talk us through the season so far. The women's hockey have really put the disappointment of last season behind them. A dominant year saw them go undefeated, only dropping points against their title challengers Exeter. However, a 5-0 win against their Cardiff counterparts took the title on the last day of the season and secured their place in the promotion playoff on the 27th of March. They'll be hoping to put the icing on the cake by gaining their place back in the National League. The women's rugby have come up against some top opponents in recent weeks. However, some courageous performances have earned them a quarter-final game against Loughborough here at Concoid. The Archers basketball WBBL team have really improved this season with lots of player development. Shannon Hatch, who earned a call-up to the Swiss national side, and Lauren Saiki have really shone. The team are feeling really positive after coming to the end of the season. The Bucks football side have had a mixed season with some very dominant performances, but fell slightly short in their cup quarter-final after coming up against a strong Nottingham side. The weekend team have also seen lots of success and are currently in phase two of their season, hoping to end on a positive note. They've got a cup final this weekend against rivals Cardiff City, so we wish them the best of luck. Women's water polo were victorious this year after a shaky start, losing their first game of the season. Since then, they've remained unbeaten and have taken the title. And thanks for that, Caitlin. Lots of exciting events have been taking on camp camp taking place on campus recently. Now, on campus today, sport took an unexpected standstill because of some early spring snow. Our reporter, Neve Westgarth, is out there for us now. Thanks, Meg. As you can see, I'm down here at Rugby One, and it is very snowy here on King Koi campus. Although all fixtures have been postponed due to the snow. Big fixtures for the women's first team against Loughborough in their quarter final and for the men's first hockey team in their semi final in the national base have been called off. But there is one fixture still going ahead today. The men's rugby first team are playing Leeds Beckett away at Leeds at 2 pm. So good luck to them. Back to the studio. Thanks, Neve. Don't stay out there too long. Now, we've been searching around campus looking for some Met superstars to find out about the things that are important to them. What would be your good luck charm? Hi, my name is Abigail Yunker, and these are my Archer's Essentials. I picked this up here because back home I drank something called Pedialyte. Um, but when I came here, um, I tried this. I really liked it. It has some caffeine in it, which is always good for a little boost before a game. Yeah, so I did go to Costco and I got about a 24 pack of these. So I'm all stocked up for the season. <laughs> this is my Aquaphor chapstick. This started back home. Um, I got really chapped lips and this was the only thing that um, would work for me. And then my teammates wound up knowing that I would have it, so they would always come ask me for it. Um, I want to say I have about five of these and a big, big one too. So I'm kind of obsessed with it. <laughs> this is my pregame warm-up band. It's like part of my pregame routine. Um, I'll do some different exercise with it. Um, I've been doing it since I was back home, so had to bring it over here and gets me gets me warmed up for the game. I do it more for defense, like to get me going laterally, to get my legs warmed up a little bit so I can move quick. This is my homemade uh, cold brew coffee. I make it in this cold brew maker the night before and it has to brew overnight. And then, um, yeah, I have ice in here, I have pour the coffee in, and then I have some vanilla flavoring and some milk. It's a whole process. <laughs> it's kind of fun. It, it's a fun uh, game day ritual to go get coffee, or, or I started making it here because the Starbucks is a little different than back home. But um, yeah, it's more like just a fun game day. Um, 
in the routine. This is my friend Winnie the Pooh. I haven't had this specific pillow for long, but I've had a love for Winnie the Pooh for a long time. And it's something my friends back home, we kind of have like a personal um, connection to Winnie the Pooh. So um, I love having this with me here. It kind of reminds me of home. Um, I do sleep with it at night and I take it with me on road trips. I can use that as a pillow or keeps me company. I tend to lose a lot of things, but he did turn back up. He made the suitcase. I had to squeeze him in my suitcase to get here, but of course he made the cut. My name's Abigail Yunker and these are my Archer's Essentials. An interesting collection from Abigail there. Love that Winnie the Pooh. Now I'm joined by our correspondent Dav Jones. Thank Hi. you for joining us. Anytime. Uh, can I ask what would your five essentials be? Oh, uh, in my bag there's always a laptop. Uh, always need that. Uh, notepad and pen might be cheating, but in my car there's always three different pairs of shoes. So I'm going to call that five. <laughs> you always don't know what you're going to need to do that day, what the terrain is. Yeah. <laughs> Have Brilliant, shoes. no judgment. Everyone, everyone's got something. Now, it's International Women's Day today, and there mm. seems to be a lot going on recently in the wonderful world of women's sport. Absolutely. We've got the Women's Football World Cup this year, the Women's Six Nations kicks off at the end of this month. We saw the ICC Women's T20 World Cup Fantastic, last month. Yeah. It seems like women's sport is getting more recognition in some areas. Would you Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, women's sport in Britain is one of the biggest growth markets I think we can see in sports. Uh, with funding coming in and recognition across the country and also internationally. Um, we're seeing that in football being kind of the groundbreaker, the trailblazer in that. And now other sports are coming along too, including the tennis. The World Cup was fantastic. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it carrying on. Women's sport growing in Britain is just going to be better for the game all, all the way around. And lots going right on right here in King Koi campus. Yeah. In particular, women's basketball team have had yeah. a busy season so far, haven't yeah. they? How have they been getting on? Just give us a little recap. Um, well, they're, they're out of bucks, unfortunately. They lost in the quarterfinals quite recently. Uh, the BBL trophy also, they went out of the quarterfinal stage. Um, so I think you'd be reasonable to be slightly underwhelmed if you weren't maybe tied into the way the basketball team actually feels. But if you go and chat down to Steph Collins, Sarah Wagstaff, any of those key members of the basketball program, they're all quite happy. Uh, they were focused on player development and they feel as if they've got everything they needed out of this season. So it's just about getting that best standing. Um, and what do you think they need to they need to sort of do, need to change going into, say, next season for those for those bigger things? the games? Um, next season, I think if they could, as much as we love the stardom of people like Shannon Hatch and Lauren Psyche, I think there is sometimes an over-reliance on them to save save the game kind of thing. Um, so I think next season, if we could see the emergence of a couple of new stars, uh, that, would, that would be really good for the team, especially with Izzy Bunny and heading off to America. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was my next question, though. A few, oh. few superstars in the team. As you mentioned, Shannon Hatch, she yeah. plays internationally. Yeah. Uh, Izzy Bunyan's off to the States. What makes these players stand out for you? I think it's their defensive versatility more than anything. Um, Steph Collins has been talking all season about improvements on the defensive end and they really got that in their recruitment. They got long, wide players. So they really disrupt the game and then they run out fast and that catches the eye. It makes a great highlight reel. And when these scouts are looking for players across the globe, that's what's going to really catch their attention, that speed, that transition. So, um, yeah, it, I think it's all coming from Steph Collins, really. And how does the women's basketball at Met sort of set up a basis to get to those higher levels? Um, I think that comes from recruitment more than anything. Uh, we've got fantastic skills here at King Coyd, the ability to study and play, to be able to progress academically in career opportunities um, whilst playing basketball for elite athletes. I think that's essential because then they can provide some security as well as living out their dreams being a sportsman. So uh, I think getting players in, people like Steph Collins, you know, GB, appearance record holder, that draws players in. So as long as we can keep pushing as we can, as we have been, and the resources at King Coyd Campus are fantastic, Archer's Arena is unbelievable. So I think people are always going to want to play here, so as long as we can get them through the door, we'll be fine. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thanks for that. And Dav will be back later for another chat. And one person who is certainly progressing is Izzy Bunyan, who was off to Montana this summer. Dav, you caught up with her earlier, so let's take a look. 
Here at Archers Arena, we've developed and fostered talents from across the globe. But next year, one of our homegrown players is traveling to the USA. Izzy Bunyan has been here since she was 14, but her future now lies with Montana State. Got my eye on Bunyan today. Um, I just yep. want to see if she can replicate the scoring that she gave us in the last game. Nine points in the first game this year, but 21 in a very, very close game last time out. When the team needed her, she put the team on her back. Told everyone I got this, and I want to see if she can do that again Yes, today. I think she definitely could. She's been showing that in all of her GB games, mm -hmm. archers, all different leagues and everything. She's doing really well. She looks like she's got a very bright future ahead. We're very lucky to have her here. So Izzy, uh, you've just committed to Montana State. Go Bobcats. Um, but why did you choose Montana State? I mean, were there other schools? Uh, yeah, so I basically went to over there for two visits. So I went to Montana first and then spent two days there. And then we went to a school in North Carolina. And then when I came home then, I kind of just had to weigh things up um, and obviously chose Montana. Um, I don't really know why I pick it. Everyone always asks me and I'm just like, I don't really know. Just, there's just good vibes. I'm hoping three or four years, I think it's four, um, do my time, get my degree hopefully. And yeah, and then see where that takes me then. Yeah, I think we kind of knew with Izzy that, um, you know, she was always having that ambition to want to go to America because I think for anyone that's kind of coming through, you know, the age groups, whether that's GB under 16s, GB under 18s, kind of that performance pathway, they kind of have the ambition to want to try and see what that, you know, life experience is like out in the States. Um, obviously, if you can play at Division One level, even Division Two, um, and some that even go Division Three, like it's still a great opportunity. The one thing about Izzy that we absolutely love is just seeing her growth. You know, getting limited minutes three years ago to now being a starter and playing such a pivotal role, not only on the offensive end but the defensive end as well. Like she was huge in our Seven Oaks game in the second half to kind of get that comeback and uh, go into overtime last weekend. And you just see that that growth and that maturity come. And I'm um, really excited to see what's next for her. So Steph Collins, in a nutshell, how much of an impact has she had on your career and this move? She's given me so many opportunities and developed me and made me this player so I'm very grateful to her. Yeah, she's a good girl. So is it bittersweet to be leaving the Archers for Montana or is it just all out excitement? Uh, it's a bit of both. Um, you know, I do love it here. I've been here for a while now and it does feel like home. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I, I am excited to go. Um, for like, It's like a new adventure. And we wish her all the best out there. Just incredible. One person who knows a little bit about coming over to Wales for sport is our very own Cleaver Hannigan. Thank you for joining us, Cleaver. No worries at all. Um, what's it like moving to a new place specifically for sport? Um, different, because you have to be sure that it's the right decision. Like It's a lot of checking out the facilities. Will it compare to what facilities you're coming from? Will it overtake? or Because the last thing you want is for your training to suffer. Like when you're competing at a high level, the last thing you want is that your training suffers because you made a decision to go somewhere. So you do sort of have to do your research and make sure that this is the right place for you and that you do fit in with the coaching style and the team that you are going to because not everyone fits in with every team. Like there's so many like team environments and different personalities and people that you're not always going to fit in. So it's about that being able to get involved in that team environment and make sure it benefits you and improves the sort of athlete that you want to be. Now, you play for Cardiff Met's water polo team who won the league recently, so congratulations. Mm -hmm. What was that like? What was that feeling like? Um, it was good. Yeah, no, it was good because we waited for so long to find out, even though we actually did technically win it back when we won our final game but none of us actually read the rules properly, so we didn't realise. <laughs> um, because our final game was against the people we tied on points, because we beat them in the head-to-head, -head, that meant we won rather than going to goal difference. But we, we thought it was goal difference, so if we had to read it, if we read the rules, we would have <laughs> known we won back in December, but that's sports and university for you. <laughs> no, it was different, because last year we finished third, um, and they were the one team we lost to a couple of times. So it was nice to beat them and to win top of the league for my final year as well. Uh, so how did you get into water polo? Is it something that you've always wanted to play? Um, it's a weird one because I came from swimming and football. 
um, I sort of mixed that. I stopped doing both during COVID and then I came back and I just didn't have the time to commit because I was swimming like 20 hours a week so I didn't have that time. So I knew I still wanted to be in the water and I'd always looked at water polo at home but the university I was in and my home club, we just didn't have water polo teams local. The closest one for me was about two, three hours away. So it wasn't around me growing up, but I always knew it was there. So I said I'd give it a go and see what it was like. And what was it specifically about uh, water polo in Wales that drew you in? Um, just a group of people as well. Like it's not overly popular. So I wouldn't feel like, because I started a lot later, I wouldn't feel like I'm starting at a disadvantage. I could slip in quite nicely and then yeah, I could slip in quite nicely and realise that I'll fit into a team because a lot of the skills I had from both swimming and football were transferable because I went into a similar position. Um, so it, it didn't feel like I'd missed out even though I hadn't been playing for years. It didn't feel like I, had, like I hadn't. Like I meant I slipped in quite easily to the team. Now it's very much a team effort with water polo, isn't it? Do any sort of um, senior players come down and help out in the coaching staff area of things? Yeah, so we don't really have a head coach. We, a lot of it is to rely on players. We do have someone from the local team come down um, when he's free. He's friends with a lot of the players on the team. So he comes down when he's free, which we, would be the closest to a head coach. But Outside of that, all our coaching is done by actual the senior players who've been playing since they were young. So as a lot of our captains will do the coaching for training. And they take a lot of what we want into consideration. They don't just have a plan going into every session. They'll see what do we want to work on and what do we feel we need to improve on and we'll go from there. Sometimes they'll have a plan because if they know there's something in it, like after a game and they realise that we did that awfully, they're like, OK, we need to fix this then they'll do that, but a lot of the time they will listen to what we have to, like what we feel like they want to do. Well, thank you very much, Quiva. Now, one person who knows all about helping out the next generation is Cardiff Met Netball's captain, Tia Maddock. Step up! Step up! Step up! Oh! Oh, it's a do! Today wasn't a day for me to turn around and be like, we need to win this game. I'm putting this on you. We need the promotion. If we don't win this game, that's not going to happen. I was never going to be like that in the first place. You guys, and I've said to you before, react so well off positivity. Feeling warm, yeah. sharp, yeah. Yeah. ready. Yeah. Yeah. Did you eat today? Yes. 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 Thank God for that. <laughs> yes! We're card! Good meals, confidence. Yeah! Not often, first time. Chloe, Chloe, first time. Do you know that shows how they're both the same style of shooter? Yeah! Good job, nice and steady. That is what I'm talking about. Briar, that's cracking. Really, really good job. Actually getting into that then at the end of that quarter, yeah, yeah. really started to work. Our rotational movement is really good. That's a good defensive centre pass. Oh, take your feet. This intensity needs to stay. This is half time point. It is nil nil, like Chloe says, as always. Second phase, Shannon option. Oop, no way she should have got that rebound. <laughs> she is like, that's mine, thank you. Oh. Last quarter, last push, give it absolutely everything you've got. But then you got that meal. Good, Lofty. Oh, all the green, yellow, and orange ones are left. Thumbing in. Oh, it's a do. That ball shouldn't have gone. Come on. I know you've been getting a lot of court time this season, I know you haven't this game, so I know it feels a bit right now. And that doesn't mean to take away anything that you guys are not good enough, because that isn't the case. Woohoo! Yes, Evie! Good job. You're a good job. Emotion! Honestly, I can't even say how grateful I am to be a part of this team, this team in particular. It means the absolute absolute world to me, like absolute world to me and I think you need to understand that you've not only shaped me as a coach, you have made my entire experience, oh. yeah, like completely and I'm so so proud, we have one game left and you know what girls, it doesn't matter whether we win or lose because we got the promotion anyway. <laughs> Yes, well, really interesting to hear just how much goes into coaching and being a leader on and off the court. Now, Cardiff Met Sport are launching a brand new project called Aspirational Archers, which celebrates the accomplishments of Cardiff Met sportswomen. Their first aspirational archer is CEO of Wales Netball, Celtic Dragons and lecturer here at Cardiff Met, Vicky Sutton. 
played netball in primary school. We used to train three times a week after school. We were an incredibly well-drilled primary school netball team. I then went and played hockey when I got to high school and, and football at university. My sister was an international netballer. She played under 21s for Wales. So I got to see international netball from an early age too, which was great. My first role in sport was for Hockey Wales. I um, did some administration work there and then had a couple of different roles. Myself and a friend then set up a refugee netball club around seven years ago now. And we worked with an amazing group of individuals that had come to the UK and been displaced from, from their home countries. And it was just a wonderful experience. Netball is, is so powerful and, and it brought so much joy to that group of ladies. Um, and then just started doing a bit of tutoring for Wales netball and remembered how, how brilliant the sport was. Uh, and then got the role as head of growth first a couple of years ago and then CEO not long, not long after. We have 200 clubs in Wales and, and growing. Uh, over 10,000 affiliated members. So there's lots of places in Wales you can play netball. We have a programme for two to six year olds called Netball Tots. And we have programmes right the way up for, for older adults, you know, walking netball and, and hopefully seated netball will launch soon, which is super exciting. I'd suggest netball to any young boy or, or girl that wants to, you know, make some new friends, grow in confidence and develop skills that will go with them throughout their lives. I actually met Tani Gray Thompson, who's the current chair of Sport Wales, amongst other things that she does, when I was probably about seven or eight years old. And I remember not, not necessarily what she said, but how she made me feel. She literally made me feel like I was the only person in that room. And it's, it's a real skill and it stuck with me for a long time. So that sort of warming and, and how she related to people is something that I've, I've looked up to her for for a long time. She's incredibly good at talking to people. I'm fortunate that I have a lot of great friends that are role models to me every day. Um, Victoria Ward was, was a line manager of mine for a few years and I certainly learned a lot from her. Um, Sarah Jones, my predecessor, learned a lot and she's still a role model. Rhea burridge Mail, she's just about to depart as CEO of Hockey Wales. Real inspiration for me. Um, lots of great female CEOs, you know, Hannah at golf, Leisha at cricket, um, Kaz Spanton at cycling, just coming back. There's, there's, there's lots. I have a very matter of fact approach on barriers. I, I believe you can smash through any barrier if you just have the right resources. So for me, when we talk about barriers in netball, it's not necessarily what's going to stop me. It's what can we do to just get rid of that. So with the refugee netball club I mentioned, transport was a real barrier. So we got some grant funding to pay for taxis to get there. Um, equipment can be a barrier. You have, you really have to have a good pair of trainers to play netball. We're putting bins all around the, the country where people can donate netball trainers that maybe have still got a good bit of life in them. As females, we typically aren't as confident, which is really sad, and I really hope that, that netball that always improves people's confidence rather than reduces it. But I, I do think that the, it takes a lot of guts and spirit to walk into a session where you don't know anyone. And, and all I'd say is, is take that step over the threshold because it's netball will really enrich your life and you're going to meet a lot of friends for life in that session it's just getting through that door you know you can you can do it and it will be one of the the best things you've ever done now from court to pitch two more aspiring archers have joined me now millie forkings and amelia baker thank you both for joining me now you both play for cardiff mets football team but first emmy how has it been coming over from america to play in wales how was that transition it's been good. It's definitely a transition. Um, the culture and everything is quite a bit different than back home, but I've really enjoyed it here, meeting all the girls, meeting the coaching staff. It's been a lot of fun. And what was it about Cardiff Met and Wales that sort of drew you in? What, what swayed that decision? Well, I was looking around at different schools in the UK, and Cardiff Met just stood out. Um, the coaching staff, like the environment here, it was all really nice, really high quality. So there's just nothing not to love about it. <laughs> um, now, just moving on to Cardiff Met football in general, I believe, uh, Millie, you have a big game coming up this weekend. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a massive one this weekend. So we've got our rivals, Cardiff City, in the Adran Premier Cup final. So the girls have worked really hard for this one. And of course, being knocked out of the other cup, this means even more for us to come in with some silverware this year. Uh, and for you specifically, have you got a bit more of an invested interest in this it's, game? It's a big one for me because last year I was on the other team playing against Met in the cup final. So to be playing against my old team that I was with for three seasons, 
it's going to be a big one. It's a bit more nervous for me, obviously, because like, I know everyone on the team. I know the coaches know everyone. So it's a big one for me to prove how far I've come on this season with Matt. Yeah, that must be quite a difficult sort of uh, thing to balance. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, but how has the season for both of you now been going so far? So on like a personal level, it's been really good because obviously I came to Matt to start on the pitch. I didn't want to be on the bench anymore. I thought I got to a point where I didn't want to be watching the game. I wanted to be playing the game. So I came to Matt looking to build confidence and play. So on a personal level, it's been really good to start every week. And I think it's like showing massively in my game. But as a team, hasn't always been the best, but we've stuck by each other's sides and we've done what we can. We've come off the back of two hard losses and going into a cup final. So it shows resilience from the team and how good we are together. And yes, over you, I mean, how, how's it yeah. been going? Been going good. I think for Bucks, there's been some up and downs to say the least. But I think we're all quite happy and still excited for next year. So what do you think it is about these sort of um, stronger teams, maybe, that, that Cardiff Mets need to take away from them? I think a lot of what the stronger teams have got is things like speed and stuff like that. A lot of our players, they're very strong, they can go in for a good tackle, but we get beat with things like speed, so I think that's something we need to work on for next season and look at. And obviously a lot of other teams, they, they all train more than us. So that's something else we need to look at is off the pitch, what can we do to help us next season to be the fittest team in the league? Because there's a lot of uh, younger players coming up, which they then have used to be. But uh, like the likes of TNS, they got such a young team, which means they're fast, they're quick for the full 90 minutes. So that's something we need to look at next year. And um, just for, uh, women's football in general, do you think it's getting the recognition it deserves? Do you think anything needs to change? Yeah, it's been a big difference, isn't there? I think this season more than others. When I first came into this league, I was 15, so that was four years ago now. And uh, it was it was quite quiet, there was nothing really about it. And now, like, it's like all over the place. Like, you can see it all over social media. And not just on the women's sites, a lot of the men's sites are like, giving the women the recognition they need. I mean. Yeah, I agree. I think coming from America, the setup was quite different here. Right. Um, and then even compared, I'm in my third year now, and compared to my first year, it's been a massive improvement. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you both. Now let's take a look at how things are changing towards women's football. Hello, uh, my name is Lucy Ford, and I am one of the co-founders of the campaign Hair Game Table. <laughs> The main aim was to, you know, firstly kind of, you know, we want to tackle sexism, firstly in football, um, that's how it started initially, um, but we also really want to promote grassroots and, you know, give back to those clubs that, you know, at grassroots level for girls, so, you know, so they can have a pathway and, you know, the opportunities that the men get as well and the boys, um, but we also want to make football grounds safe so space for everyone to attend games. As time has gone on, we've got ambassadors, so ambassadors are the kind of liaison between ourselves and the club because obviously we can't be at every single club um, and yeah it's been you know those ambassadors really are the beating heart of the campaign and um, we've probably got over 60 now um, and you know we've got about five or six of us that really do the day-to-day -day kind of you know speak, doing emails social media we've partnered with over 60 Premier League and Football League clubs and we've also partnered with clubs in the National League clubs in America, um, we've also partnered with lots of grassroots clubs all across the UK um, and we've also managed to take her game to in two different sports and um, we partnered with the Gloucestershire Cricket Club back in um, May of last year which was amazing and we also partnered with Bristol Bears as well so it's in both cricket and rugby union and both sides are completely flourishing as well which is amazing to see um, and we kind of replicate what we're doing on the football side with cricket and rugby because both um, both clubs came to us and felt that was a real need um, and obviously on the cricket side we're actually partnering with Cardiff Met and um, Cricket Club which is amazing um, you know to put out into universities as well which is really really exciting whether it's um, being a coach whether it's being um, a journalist whether it's being a referee you know we really want to you know, we really want young girls and young women to to flourish and, you know, get into these positions. It is so good to see those steps are being taken to change the way women's sport is supported. Now, I'm joined again by Dav, who's here to talk about the Women's Football World Cup, which starts July this year. An amazing event, 
should be really exciting considering how well the lionesses have been doing recently oh, but not all positive is it as it was recently announced yeah. that fifa have awarded saudi arabia's state tourism authority sponsorship of the 2023 women's world cup there is a saudi arabia influence already in the football scene as owners of newcastle united of what makes this scenario different um it's different because saudi arabia Although there has been a bit of progression in the past few years, has been lagging behind in its uh, progression of women's rights. So in this tournament, which is meant to be the biggest Women's World Cup of all time in terms of viewership, fan engagement, you'd assume that they'd want to be attaching themselves to organisations, nations, states that are all supporting the same thing. But of course, that's not quite the case. Is there maybe a viewpoint that um, this sponsorship of the Women's World Cup is bringing in more money? Is, is that even an excuse? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, people have been urging for in investment uh, in the women's game for about a decade now. There's been a real need, real urgency for that. So I think you could make an argument that, yes, this is an enormous amount of money from Visit Saudi Arabia, and maybe this is just the way the world is nowadays. But uh, I've got a little quote. I've come prepared. So The Guardian has reported that Saudi Arabia has spent at least $1.5 billion on sports washing since 2015. So at a certain point, maybe you've got to think, yeah, OK, we need money, we need investment. But the line's got to be drawn somewhere, surely. Now, Saudi Arabia's poor human rights for women, which you've touched on, surely makes yeah. this an extremely controversial decision by FIFA. What do you think of it? Why do you think they've done it? Is it just for the money? or? Um, unfortunately, it probably is just for the money. I don't see any other reason why uh, Visit Saudi Arabia should be the big, the primary sponsor for a World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I don't think anyone's particularly happy about it. We've had Lucy Bronze uh, coming out saying that it was tone deaf. And uh, also, I've got another quote for you. Uh, the James Johnson, he's the CEO of the Football Association of Australia, and he was quoted saying that Football Australia has consulted on this matter and it was an overwhelming consensus that this partnership doesn't align with the collective vision for the tournament and falls short of our expectations of our partnership with FIFA. So I think pretty damning there to be fair that even the nation hosts aren't happy with this, none of the players are happy with this, I can't imagine that this partnership is going to either last or if it does you'll see way more protests than even we saw in Qatar this summer. I was just going to say a similar mm. contro controversy in the Men's World Cup yeah. with it being hosted in Qatar in the first place. Um, why do we, why does FIFA maybe keep making these mistakes? <laughs> uh, I don't want to say it's just money again, <laughs> but I mean, the, the difference here is it's not being hosted in Saudi Arabia. So we might actually be able to see some of that protest that was resisted and restricted when we were in Qatar uh, in December. So we might actually, if FIFA do pursue this and push on, we might actually get some of that um, global attention on the negative sides that maybe we lacked a little in Qatar. Now, I read earlier that as recently as 2018, women and girls in Saudi Arabia were still barred from taking part in schools or even watching sports yep. in stadiums. So how can FIFA think this is sensible? How much backlash do you think they will get come July? It's going to be an enormous amount of backlash. Um, but I think, unfortunately, Saudi Arabia has managed to... Um, almost mask some of their negatives when it comes to women's rights. So things such as women are now allowed to drive ever since June 2018. But most reports leave out the fact allowing to the permission of their husband or father. So guardianship is still in place in Saudi Arabia, which means that technically a woman doesn't really have the choice to work, get a passport or drive without the written permission of either her father or once she's married her husband. So unfortunately, whilst we are seeing small progressions, unless we get wholesale change, Saudi Arabia is going to be falling behind for years to come. Well, thank you, Dav. Lots of talking points there. It'll be very interesting to see come July. Now, we've all wondered what life as an athlete is really like. Full State have given us an insight behind the scenes. <laughs> I'm going to start working out more. Okay. I'm going to start with lunges. It'll be All a right. good first step for me. Okay. Do you get it? No. Explain. First step. Oh, that's funny. I don't think I should sing on the mic. 
Oh, whoa. <laughs> I maxed on my squat today, so that was cool. I don't know what I'm at. Are you counting? I don't know what I'm at. I forgot to start my time. I don't remember what I'm at. I don't remember what I'm at. I didn't count. LeBron James. <laughs> Would you like to say something? Oh, oh, look at my socks. They're hamsters lifting weights. <laughs> I thought it was perfect. <laughs> Ooh. Started too soon. Oh wait, we're just going one after the other. It's cone! Ooh, I love aerials. Ooh. You call it cornhole bags or bags? Uh, cornhole. See, I don't know. I kind of cornhole. Like yeah, I think you. <laughs> cornhole bags. Oh, I am so ready to nap tomorrow. That was pretty fire. Come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I like bugs. Not all. I don't like cockroaches. Those are gross. Woo! Party foul. <laughs> okay. This kid to said Toady Lee tubular today, or yesterday, in my kids' classes, and I think I'm gonna start saying it again. Totally tubular. <laughs> I can't Oh, on the mat. <laughs> PSU! What day is it? It's botany day! <laughs> I love botany day. It's so fun. I like botany days. Um, the vascular elements. Yes! <laughs> I'm guessing three. I don't know if the middle one counts. I did the wrong Ooh. one. Ooh. And if you want to hear more stories like this, transatlantic storytelling is coming back in 2024, so stay tuned. And sticking with gymnasts, we've been getting to know some of our own archers by finding out their essentials. Ooh. I'm Ella Hartwell, and these are my archers' essentials. <laughs> This is my archer's leotard competitions. Um, I've worn it twice and I've washed it after every competition, so it's quite clean actually. We did, it was obviously my first competition for competing for Met, and um, I placed overall and I wasn't expecting it at all. We were competing against like 40, 50 odd people and I placed all around and I wasn't expecting it at all. So I brought Lucas Aid because I'm always hyper. Um, I have energy all the time and like I'm known for being the crazy one out of the group. Like I'm always doing unhinged things that no one expects. I've always got loads of energy, so that's why I bought this. Yeah, drink this all the time. Absolutely love it. Uh, constantly stocked in my fridge. Cool. <laughs> 
So I brought my Crocs because I don't wear shoes anywhere. I'm constantly wearing these no matter where I go. I'd wear them on a night out if I could. And uh, the gibbets, the Winnie the Pooh ones, I'm obsessed with Winnie the Pooh. So everything in my room is Winnie the Pooh. Like, I, I'm obsessed with it. Tigger, because he's hyper like me, always. <laughs> I used to wear sliders and then I came to uni and invested in a pair of Crocs and I've, I've just fallen in love with them. I'm obsessed. <laughs> so this is my speaker. I take it to every single training session. Um, I'm always on music, no matter where we go, even when we go up to competitions on the bus. Screw the, screw the radio, I'm on speaker. American Boys, a tune and a half. I love that song. I will not be singing that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves my music. Everyone loves it. But that's why I'm always on speaker. <laughs> this is my last bucket left. So I brought these because every single time, even before or after training, I eat these. I'm obsessed with them. I can't stop eating them. I don't know what it is about them. There's just something about them that are unreal. Chicken, always, never deviate, always the same. If I could afford it, I'd have at least one a day, but I can't afford it. So, like, I don't know, I'd say maybe three or four packets a week. I'm Ella Hartwell, and these are my Archer's Essentials. Now, one Met athlete who has been a real advocate for mental health is our own Lara Rebecca. Here's her story. I just became lost in this bubble. I had no confidence. I was hiding myself away. Something that initiated primarily just as a coping mechanism, then developed quite sinisterly towards then becoming my identity. My name is Lara Becker, I'm 22 years old and I study sports and exercise science at Cardiff Metropolitan University. I was always very perfectionistic and very anxious and over quite a few years that kind of amalgamated into me developing severe anxiety disorder. Um, all of these kind of built up ever so gradually, which led me then to develop an eating disorder. I was then diagnosed with anorexia nervosa at the age of 16, and, you know, the bubbly, young, outgoing Lara had vanished into something that was really struggling, and, yeah, life, life wasn't the most positive. My identity, as I said, was getting absolutely taken away by this eating disorder. Things really hit home um, when I was... Uh, again in my teenage years, which I then lent me to be sent to hospital. Um, and then treatment began. Fortunately, after quite a few years, after changing my social environment, after respecting my underlying triggers, after doing a lot of more holistic work, I was able to gradually come out of it. I can proudly say that I'm on a positive side of it now and, you know, positive in my recovery. I signed up to the Cardiff Half Marathon in 2017 and it was fundraising for the eating disorder charity Beats. So again, it was just celebrating the fact that I had recovered from eating disorder and I was strong and I was able and I was fit again. That definitely restored my relationship with fitness um, and then I just kept going. It's freedom, it's escapism. It's when university gets horrifically stressful, it's that escapism as well. I've done so many wonders for mental wellbeing. I love athlete wellbeing, athlete welfare. Um, and I've always made content revolving, you know, awareness of mental health conditions and eating disorder awareness, primarily to destigmatize a lot of the stigmas and the negative connotations and the false connotations that are often held in society towards eating disorder specifically. I think initially there's a lot of assumptions with anorexia that it's just a symptomatic illness but really there's a psychological element to it so recovery was really focusing on that side of things and once you know that your mindset towards sport fitness living an active lifestyle is healthy it can have so many positive contributions 
So I think it's something phenomenal and you know one of the key things that we can do for our mental well-being. Anyone who's currently struggling with their own mental health and needs someone to talk to, the relevant helplines are on screen now. And from one inspirational woman to another, I'm now joined by two of our very own on-campus captains from rugby and hockey, E.C. Cantrell and Neve Wesker. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, firstly, E.C., just a quick one about your game tonight against Loughborough. Sadly cancelled because of the snow. How do you feel about that? Any rescheduling? Yes, I think it'll be rescheduled for next week. Um, the boys play Loughborough and we'll play Loughborough, so hopefully it'll be, it'll be like a doubleheader type of situation. But... We were really excited to play, so we're a little disappointed about the snow. Quite a big game. How do you how do you yeah. sort of cope with that mentally, having the having the cancellation, having you know, been so hyped up? Well, we prepared really well, so we just look at it as a positive. You know, we get an extra week to train. We got to train in the Archers Arena today, and then you know we got to go and play in the snow. So it's it's good team connection, and it's a good way to you know have some fun while staying focused. Well, hopefully next week then. And as a, a captain, do a lot of the players sort of look to you when these things happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, yeah, I mean, I'm always there to help, but I think one thing about the Archers is that we have so many girls that our team is so connected and we have such good chemistry that we all trust each other. So I think we're all there for each other that, you know, we just have a really good support system. And Neve, you're also captain of the women's first hockey team here at Met. How have you found that role this year? I think it's been like a, it's been super exciting, but also challenging sometimes. A little bit like having 17 children, but do you know what? <laughs> it's all good fun. And I think what's nice is very similar to you guys. You've got such a good close connection mm -hmm. within a team that everyone looks to each other and helps each other, which I think is really nice. But it's been challenging, but so rewarding at the same time, especially mm -hmm. with coming off the back of winning the league. I mean wouldn't have been the same without all of those girls on that team. Yeah, so for both of you, how important would you say that that chemistry within the sports team is? I think it's like one of the biggest parts of a team, you know, being a part of a team that, you know, if you don't like each other, if you don't spend time to, with each other, it, your team isn't going to connect on the field and you're not going to trust one another. So having that trust just creates like better rugby and I'm sure it's the same for hockey. Oh, 100%. I think it's that nice uh, combination between like being on the pitch and then spending yeah. off pitch time together, like going and having a social with everyone and building those connections away from the hockey pitch only then translates onto it when you're playing. Uh, and again, for both of you, what sort of challenges would you say there are in that captain role? Um, you know, you have to deal with difficult situations sometimes, you know, like you may say something incorrect or, you know, you may, there may be drama outside of the team that you have to address, but you just kind of have to step up, bite the bullet and be that leader for everyone and like, you know, take it, take it to whatever. <laughs> I think that's similar, especially when you're in difficult situations where team selection comes around and people are looking to you for advice. And I think you've just got to find that balance between being everyone's friend, but also being a captain can be very difficult. I know that's mm. one thing that I've struggled with, but supporting everyone and only being there to like inspire and make sure everyone's still doing what they can to be their best and still having that team connection through those difficult situations. And uh, Neve, what kind of responsibilities would you say that you have on match day specifically? Um, I think it's just being positive, I think is such a big and important thing is making sure like if it's like your biggest game of the season, like we've had um, against Exeter was a really tough game for us. We drew 1-1 in the end, but just being positive and trying not to let that pressure affect you so it doesn't come off to everyone else. I think that's such an important part. And, I mean, it's very hard for me as a captain to try and keep that straight face and be able to be like, this isn't affecting me. But I've got so many good girls around me, especially with my vice captain, Anya, who helped me through that. So it's those challenges and then just being organised, I think, <laughs> as doing a master's, being a captain and oh, so many other roles. It's hard to balance everything, but it's, it's all worth it in the end. And uh, EC, you've got a, um, Reese Roberts is your coach at mm. the moment who's filling in for your coach who's currently on maternity leave. What would you say that um, sort of relationship is like between a captain and a coach? Um, I think it's been wonderful so far. Lisa's great and she's actually just come back last week. And so there's a, kind of a balance between like, now we have Reese as a, a, a great coach and then Lisa and you know, just collaborating with them. You know, we I feel like I can co go to Reese Roberts or I could go to Lisa and you know, I would be able to talk to them like just person to person and, you know, collaborate with them so our team can succeed. 
Yeah, really important, I'm sure. So thank you yeah. both for joining me. Our rugby specialist, James Roberts, has been gathering all the news surrounding Wales's women's rugby team and their new contracts. Keris Hale, Slakey George, Larry Norcott, Alex Callender, Karis Phillips, Gwen Crabb, Fionn Lewis. These are Mets' magnificent seven, alumni that have been signed on in the most recent wave of 25 professional women's rugby contracts offered by the WRU. This news comes just weeks out from the beginning of the 2023 TikTok Women's Six Nations, in which Wales will open their campaign against Ireland on the 25th of March at Cardiff Arms Park. Gwen Crabb, one of those lucky few, speaks fondly about the positive impact a moment like this in Welsh rugby history will have and the opportunity it brings for her and her teammates. I think to be able to be in as a team full time and not be worrying about work outside of rugby because that's the main thing for me, it was, it's an external stress, not having time to focus on recovery, time to focus on extra gym sessions and actually be a full time rugby player because there's a lot more to it than just playing rugby. I think it puts us in a really good place um, to move forward as, as a team and yeah, put in some better performances than we did last year, work on our work ons from the World Cup um, and hopefully yeah, finish. Top. We've we've got a lot of nutrition support, S and C support, sports like sports science, um, extra physio provision as well. Um, and just on a, on a personal note, I'm currently injured, and having that kind of level of support, more specifically around like my rehab and my recovery, has been game changing. It's allowed me to sort of push on with an injury that could have taken longer to come back from, and that has allowed me now to hopefully play like a significant role in, in Six Nations. First and foremost, we get more contact time with the players. Uh, we can build a programme around them uh, which allows them to flourish and uh, develop as players but also develop as, as rugby athletes and that's something massive that we want to do um, to continue to, to chase and close the gap with the top three teams in the world. So the general value of the contracts has risen, there's gold, silver and bronze and the bronze is at a higher level uh, than the contracts that were in place last year. We've got a maternity clause, we've got a, a bigger science and medicine team, uh, we've got access to tremendous facilities, the programme is building in all sorts of directions and that's why we're confident that the team will continue to go from strength to strength. The contracts represent a huge step forward in women's rugby within the country and it is hoped that with investment into the women's game and a new opportunity to develop even further, we can expect to see more golden moments like this. Joel, she's still going and that is the cherry in the hut of the Welsh cake. James Roberts, Cardiff Met Sport TV, Wales National Centre of Excellence. Well, we are now joined by said rugby specialist, James Roberts. Thank you for joining us, James. Thank you for calling me a rugby specialist. <laughs> <laughs> um, Usi, great news for the Welsh women. Do you think this could be a catalyst to inspire other rugby nations around the world to do a similar thing? The Celtics thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. You know, um, our girls, there's been a lot of girls on our squad who have been a part of that. Um, and they've um, developed well as players. It's given them an opportunity you know, to, to kind of be seen by Welsh rugby, you know, um, so I think it's great. And James, your news piece, you, you were there, you, you explored it all. What, what does this mean for Welsh rugby? I mean, it's hugely exciting and you mentioned it there, how it's going to be a catalyst across the entirety of, of the women's game of rugby, not just in Wales as a country itself, but it's going to ripple around the world. You know, we've seen other other parts of the home nations, you know, Ireland, Scotland, all react to giving uh, women's professional contracts out to specific players. And the fact that Wales have now extended their contracts into a squad of 25 players and they're now bringing in a larger squad of 38 for the Six Nations and our very own Catherine Richards currently yeah. playing alongside you, EC, is now involved in that Wales women's squad. It's fantastic to see and I think the quality of women's rugby in Wales can really push forward now with this news uh, and I think we can definitely start to maybe challenge those top two sides in England and France in the future. And just comparing it to rugby over in America, what, what would you say the major differences are to rugby here and rugby there? Um, I would just say there's more opportunity for rugby because because the US is so big it's kind of difficult to get everyone in one area so you, so you have to do everything in the summer and you know like I know the U20s in the US are going to play the U20 England team like U20s England just plays with each other all the time and since there's 50 states across the US like you can't meet up during the school year you have other um, yeah. things to do so I think they just have that above us and 
James, big question. How do you think Wales are going to do in the Six Nations? Oh, goodness me, handing me like a, like, I don't know, a poison <laughs> chalice there. Because it's it's such a complex issue. Obviously, as a, as a Welsh rugby fan, I want to say they're going to win. I always want Wales to win. Um, but realistically, looking at that uh, tournament, you know, two bonus points last week, uh, last year, sorry, secured Wales uh, a third place finish in the Women's Six Nations, which is fantastic. But what I think they can do this year is really push on to make it three bonus point wins and that like really cement their spot in the middle of the pack and you know keep a hold in that third place and then you know building forwards going through this next world cup cycle heading towards the next world cup they can definitely start to challenge france and england more um in games in the six nations now we've just had news in from our cardiff met boys up in leeds beckett they have won 29 14 so what do we think this means going into the game next week against loughborough either of you. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's certainly what Cardiff Met really needed. You know, they needed to get back to winning ways. They needed to, to secure a win and to get a bonus point win on the road is fantastic. I mean, to go anywhere on the road in Buck yeah. Super Rugby is one heck of a challenge because anyone can beat anyone in these leagues. I mean, you see, you yeah. know it firsthand yourself in the Women's National League. It's incredibly competitive between every university. Yeah, I think it's... The women's have struggled with away games. We haven't won an away game this year, so I think, and especially off the men's losing streak, it's just like a boost that... Cardiff Met rugby as a whole could use, especially with the new doubleheader that's coming up next week. Yeah, I was just going to touch on that. How 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 important do you think that will be, having both the men's and women's team face Loughborough on the same day? I think it'll bring a lot of energy. Hopefully, we'll get a lot of people out in the, in the stands, and I think that we'll have rugby one home field advantage, and I think it'll be really good. Should, should be an occasion. Just going back now to the Welsh women's news, how do you think that these new contracts will inspire future generations in rugby, James? I mean, Gwen mentioned it there in that little piece and getting to talk to her more actually at the centre of excellence on the day is that back when she was starting off to play rugby and when she was a lot younger, there wasn't really that path visible for, for women and for girls playing rugby and starting to pick up the sport for the first time. But now we need to we need to cover this more in the news. We need to show off this fantastic stuff that the WR are doing more because it gives those younger people uh, a sight of the path that's ahead of them. You know, there is that opportunity to continue playing women's rugby right into the future, to hold a professional contract and to represent the, your country at the top of your game. So it's it's awe inspiring, really, for, for everyone across the country, uh, no matter what your age and gender at the moment, that there is an opportunity there for you in rugby. Perfect. Well, thank you, James and EC. Now, today has been a show full of inspiration. And now here's a story all about um, redemption. Thanks for watching and goodbye.